Hey guys, this is part two of my interview with Dr. James Driscoll. I hope you enjoy. So what would you say to climate skeptics listening in right now? Believe the science. Mm -hmm. Sorry, believe the science. Understand the science. I hate the word believe. <laughs> Understand the science. <laughs> listen to the experts. Please listen to the experts. Don't listen to people on 2GB or 2UE or, or shock jock radio stations that basically are there to flame the fires. Listen to the scientists, uh, listen to the experts, um, and do your research from credible sources. So look at government websites. Don't look at conspiracy websites. Um, there's so much misinformation about climate science, uh, and, uh, and you can go down a long rabbit hole when you start um, reading these. Um, I would suggest that if, if a climate skeptic was listening to this right now, is that if you wanted to check websites, see who's writing the website, see where they're affiliated with, see where they're, where they're coming from. Are they a university or are they um, a industry sponsored mouthpiece? So that's the one thing I'd say. No, absolutely. So what do you, you as a scientist think the Australian government should be doing to combat climate change? Um, I think that I, I really think that we we have to get the message out there about renewables. Stop the bullshit. Get the the message out about, about renewables being cheaper. Invest in renewables. Um, I think the number one thing that we need to do is make battery uh, storage, uh, battery storage systems uh, cheap enough for people to install in their houses. And it's getting to the point where that's nearly there. Um, I was one of the, uh, our house here, we were one of the early innovators of um, solar energy. That was uh, 14 years ago, we put solar panels in our house. Um, I would certainly consider in the future, um, in the future, probably six to 12 months of having a battery installed in our house. Yeah. Um, I think that's one thing the government needs to do. And, and the government needs to get its messaging correct because this, the, the climate skeptics within the government at the moment have a very large voice. I mean, when you have an ex-prime minister like Tony Abbott saying that the climate, uh, that the science behind climate change is bullshit, I think he said that that word said it was shit, if I remember correctly. But having that coming from an elected official was disappointing and so damaging, even over uh, years since he said that, um, it's, it's very frustrating. So the government in power needs to listen to the scientists, listen to the data, that's what's important, and, and especially renewable energy. I mean, look, renewable energy now, um, when you look at the cost required to generate the electricity, um, it's cheaper than any other form of um, uh, uh, fossil, any other fossil fuel, and that's really important. We've got to capture that and, yeah. and work towards that, yeah. Absolutely. So on that note, with because Australia's government can be, they're not quite doing enough is what I reckon, but yeah. uh, how do you think the world will look in 2050? Oh, right. I've, I've thought hard, long and hard about this, actually. I've been asked this before. Um, okay, so to, the preamble I'll give to you is that back in the 1950s and 60s, um, people would look ahead to, 20, to the year 2000, uh, towards 2000, and we'd have hoverboards. And as Seth Century famously said, where's my hoverboard? All right. So I think Seth Century is actually from Frankston, actually, or somewhere down there. Um, don't know who Seth Century is, do you? No. <laughs> He's a, he was on Triple J for a while. He's a, uh, he's a, a rapper. Okay, look oh. it up. Um, but, uh, they thought we'd have cars that would be um, driverless and we'd be able to sit in there and, and we'd be zooming through the skies in these little cars, okay? We're still in, we're in 2020 now and it still hasn't occurred. So when people look forward, um, often you find that, uh, that it's complete. Uh, it, it's nothing like what you actually think it's going to look like. Um, on a positive note, I think that we will have uh, decentralized uh, power grids, so microgrids, um, where communities, uh, it's already happening now, I think it'd be a lot more common, where our communities are um, drawing on power from each other, um, renewable power. Um, pessimistically, that, that's my opportunist, I, th I think that that will occur, but pessimistically, uh, we're going to have a lot more climate refugees, um, and we're going to have a lot of the land, which is uh, being used for housing or production purposes, is, is going to be degraded. So um, I've got a bit of a pessimistic view on what the Earth's going to look like. I don't think it's going to be as good as 
we have now, even in the middle of COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I just, I, 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 I try to be optimistic, but the pessimist in me sees there's going to be a lot of issues. Our population is still rising. Because if you think about it, our population is like 7.8, 7.7 billion people. By 2050, we're going to have another couple of billion people. Now, if we're already degrading our um, agricultural lands, um, and if we're already degrading our coastal areas because of sea level rise and salinity issues, then we're going to have less crop yield and more people to feed. So that's a pessimistic part of me, but I try to be optimistic. I do try to be optimistic. And the optimist in me sees that we'll get to a tipping point. And I think we've gone past that tipping point, but that tipping point will come where people will suddenly realise and listen to the scientists and then things will things will click into gear. I am 16 and I can be a bit anxious about the future sometimes. I don't see societal change occurring fast enough. Governments keep fighting and most people seem to put climate change out of their minds because it's too difficult to think about and they get too overwhelmed. How do we change this? <laughs> by, by talking to your friends, your family, your colleagues, mm -hmm. by talking, by being persuasive. Um, by talking to people about the science behind climate change, by the data, what the data is showing. Um, I think that there are signs that this is working. So uh, do you watch the ABC News or Seven News? In the it, yes, so at the end of each month on ABC News, and I know that Channel 7's been doing this as well, which is, which is awesome, um, but the Monash um, climate um, uh, uh, people basically put out um, uh, data uh, so basically looking at things like you know, the number of days over 35 degrees over the last 40 years, you can see there's a clear trend that's going up. So they put out these data sets, which are included in the weather bulletins, which is really good. And that didn't used to happen a few years ago. Um, by making it a mainstream talking point about the science and the data behind climate change, that is how, um, how we, we get through this. Um, the, the, uh, the other thing is use your vote. Make sure you use your vote. Make sure your family and your friends and your colleagues um, use the vote. The vote is the most important thing we have. And sometimes it can feel as if you're insignificant and you're like, what do I do? I mean, it's just me. Um, well, um, be, be optimistic. Don't give up. Even when you feel dejected, keep your chin up, carry on going. It's how I get through the, at the day. And, um, and, and it's, it's the, the only thing that we have. Um, the vote is so important. So use it wisely and use it well. That's how you become less anxious about the future by participating in the problem. You're giving, um, breathe, you're breathing life into the problem and it will help you to be more optimistic. Yeah, absolutely. So do you think COVID-19 could be linked to climate change in any way or do you think they're totally separate? Or the, the, this is where it comes into the, um, the, the sphere of conspiracy yeah. theories which are coming up. So COVID-19 is because of the 5G network. COVID-19 is uh, manufactured by the, um, uh, the Chinese. Um, all of these things are coming up about conspiracy theories. Um, I do not think that COVID-19 is a result of climate change. But what I do think that COVID-19 can be attributed to is by human expansion into areas of the world uh, which are not naturally habitated by humans and by basically encroaching into these areas into the rainforest of the world and deforestation we see more and more interaction between us and wild animals and we see more zoonotic um, diseases um, occurring in the future. That's when, you know, zoonotic is where basically um, viruses and bacteria and other passages, pathogens cross species. Yep. So we will do that. And in fact, the film Contagion, you seen the film Contagion? No, I haven't. You need to watch the film Contagion. It's really important for you to watch it because it's almost like the, 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 the start and the middle part of Contagion is exactly what we are going through at the moment in COVID-19. There's a yeah. little bit of sides towards the end, but they get the vaccine so quickly and it works so quickly. But yeah. it's a really interesting film to watch. And I know that friends of mine who are working in the COVID-19 area are, uh, to, uh, are telling their friends to watch uh, Contagion because it gives you a sensibility of what is happening and how it happens. Oh, so well, no, COVID-19 is yeah. climate change. Okay, cool. <laughs> 
So what is your overall advice to me about the future and can humans adapt to climate change? Um, be strong, advocate for change. Um, be persuasive when you talk to people. Don't, don't automatically think, as much as you, you sometimes think this, but don't automatically think that climate change skeptics are stupid. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's a really common thing to fall into. Climate change uh, skeptics often haven't had the opportunity to talk to someone about the science. Okay? Yeah. Um, what's our future? We can adapt, we can mitigate, but we have to start that now. We have to start the transition of uh, fossil fuels not being used um, now. It has to happen now. And in fact, there's something very interesting occurred at Monash University uh, last year. Um, our first years, the first group of students that came in, we could see anxiety about climate change. Mm. So climate change anxiety is been recognised in students who are coming into the School of Earth, Atmosphere and Environment. And we and we've we've we we saw that a distinct change in attitudes of first year students last year. Yeah. So um, and that's it's it's a bad thing because people are worried and anxious. But it's a good thing because it's getting through to people now. And I think that, you know, Michaela, you and your generation of people are going to get us out of this shit. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Um, and so it, it's, it's good to see students being really proactive and being really vocal. And the student strikes last year were awesome. They were absolutely brilliant. It was, it was that kind of change that people notice rather than people like me demonstrating in the streets. <laughs> Thank you again, Dr. James Driscoll, for meeting with me today. Your knowledge and insight on climate change and the environment is always valued. I learned a lot by speaking to you and I know others would have too. So thank you again. My pleasure. And I just want to make, make it very clear that the views expressed during this interview are purely mine and they, they are not a function of Monash University. So these are my opinions um, and they shouldn't be taken as uh, what university um, um, is uh, is all about okay yeah absolutely.